Hello and welcome to the Spectacular Entrepreneur Show. Mr. Eddie Esposito, I see that you are out there. I want to see if I can get you included with us. Hello, Eddie. Yep, okay. Can you hear me now? Oh, right. Welcome aboard. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. It was quite a challenge to get in here, but I, I finally made it at the last minute, thanks to Jen. Thank you. We also had an uh, internet issue on this end, so it's obviously we're starting a few minutes late. So today's topic is the three game changers, three game changers in running a business. And uh, we can get started on that. And one of the biggest challenges that we see with most businesses is managing the calendar. Uh, ma more importantly, mastering the calendar. And we'll start off with the three things that are the biggest game changers. And then we're going to talk about how to make them new habits in your business. Okay. The three game changers is mastering the calendar knowing your numbers and being prepared. And I will say mastering the calendar probably is the catalyst to really make sure that you can come prepared and that you do know the numbers. And just to give you a little background of why these three came up and were so important to us. Over the past several years, I've been doing consultations with business owners uh, to find out what that sticking point in their business is, what's the biggest challenge, and come up with solutions to tackle to tackle those specific challenges. And they could be anything. Like you would think that most of them are going to be around marketing. In many cases, they are not. But one of the interesting things that I started to see as a trend over the years, now this is over 150 business owners that have done consultations. They complete business intake forms. So we have a very good look at how the business has developed, what type of structures they have in place how financially successful the business is. And there were three habits that were consistently coming up that separated those that were really successful and those that were struggling. And the three habits, as you can imagine, were people managing their calendar, knowing their numbers, and being prepared. Okay. What's important for you to understand is when we talk about those topics is it's not like we're looking at people that are a little bit more successful, okay? In actuality, the level of success for the people that use these habits and those are people that struggle with the habits is five to sometimes tenfold. People in the same industry, in the same market, okay, that are producing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of income while others are struggling to make a living, okay? So that is the source of how we came up with these. So what we'd like to do is then go through and talk about what could we do to be more successful in each of these areas and successfully have the habits that will make us successful in those areas. Um, Eddie, we're going to talk about calendaring. Is there is something significant that you feel is necessary in the calendar? Yeah, <clears throat> and it kind of goes to number two, which is know your numbers, but uh, because they really are totally interlinked. But I would just say this, you know, if I tell on myself a little bit, um, being a little older, that when, before the days of the, the calendars in the phone, I would, without even knowing it, double book myself or have the wrong days, whatever. So there's the chaotic part of mastering the calendar. And if you know your numbers, then you can get more intentional about what appointments to take and not to take. So we'll get into the numbers again in a minute. But the calendar is, is kind of like a hub which you rotate around uh, and it becomes a, a really guide for what you're gonna be doing every day. So the calendar is not necessarily, doesn't drive the appoint, my appointments, but all of the other things help drive what goes into the calendar so you have your schedule. So it's a really important piece for it. And I, thank God for the electronic calendars these days because I. Definitely was not the one who would carry one around with a, the, the pen and the and whatever. They had a million different kinds, but I was not really good about that or I'd leave it somewhere. So there's been a godsend that the electronic ones are around. It, it, it's funny that you weren't one to carry the paper ones because I almost became overly attached to it. 
yeah, and transitioning to the calendar, yeah. which I don't have a handwritten calendar anymore, but I, <laughs> I was really attached to it. Yeah. Well, I will say this. When you get older, there's a benefit about those. You can see them. <laughs> the phone, now i got to have the biggest phone on the planet just to see it, but I had it. So, so one of the things we want to talk about in mastering the calendar is the mindset of the calendar is yours. The calendar is your asset. And the calendar is for you to invest. The time is for you to invest um, how you see most important. And I think understanding and coming with that mindset is really critical to make sure that we're planning our calendar rather than reacting to what's going on around us. When Eddie and I, for example, when we meet in August with, with Dawn and Ivan Meisner, we, we're planning our year. And, you know, we're looking at the following year and we want to make sure we get those important things into that calendar first. And we call those the big rocks. You know, if you look, if you look at this image right now, it's a finite amount of space in that jar. And what we need to do is put the big rocks in first. Our recommendation and the way we do things is the big rocks are our life first, our personal life. Okay? When are the vacations going to be taken what are the important birthday parties or other family events that are going to go in first? Once those are in, then we put in, okay, what are the next most important things that need to get into our calendar? Uh, for example, my wife, uh, she makes sure that she has her workout schedule in there first. And she likes to stay very committed to it. Not that I'd like to work out at these times. Like, no, I got an appointment with my trainer and I'm going to work out here. Now, it may sound a little bit backwards that we're saying you know you put your life in first you know why aren't you putting in your business stuff first the most important things in your business you're telling us these are habits that successful business people have they should better prioritize their business and i would say with without good health without family support without those other important things you might not have as successful a business as you think right? so the first thing we're looking for is that we're actually planning our calendar and putting in stuff first. Okay. Along with putting things into the calendars, is setting our boundaries. Um, Eddie, I know this is as important to you as it is to me. How, how do you suggest people set their boundaries? Well, I mean, I guess it, it kind of goes back to what the big rocks are. So if the family events, and we're not talking about every little family event, but you know the things that are really important for you to be there. That you know, an easy boundary is, okay, I just will not take appointments on that on those days. You know, it has to be a extreme crisis or something. I don't think we should ever be so inflexible as that. There's nothing that can depend on that, but it's going to have to be something really major to to, to do that. Uh, the second thing I would say about boundaries is your day-to-day -day things. And this is one, you know, again, tell myself, tell myself okay. it's very easy to put in a 12-hour day. Simple. I mean, there's no, there, when you own a business, there's no end to the things you can find to do. The thing is, you, you know, if you put in 12 hours on those days, one day after day after day, you've got to pay for it somewhere. And um, that's not a good thing because it could be a you know, family problem you or a health problem that you generate. Uh, isolate yourself from your friends and neighbors and the people that are important to you. So there's the day-to-day -day boundaries that go with that as well. And then, and I guess there's things that, a, a boundary that probably doesn't get thought of is, I, I can't take on things that I'm not well equipped to do. So for example, if you're not a technology person and you know the whole website, social media thing is a bit foreign to you, uh, then taking on that is going to increase the chaos. It's going to increase the stress because it's going to frustrate you. And, you know, you're not going to get it nearly as done as efficient. It's going to take you five hours, but it takes somebody 15 minutes. So you also got to have about boundaries around your capabilities. And I think that's one that is a little less obvious sometimes because we'll say, well, I can do that myself. It seems simple. But that's, that's a big one, I think. Yeah, one, one of the things I would add to that is I – I have my boundaries that I use in my calendar. Uh, for example, just like this family time, uh, family time should be with the family, not with the family and taking calls 
at the same time. Um, one of the boundaries we have is don't work weekends. But here's, here's a little caveat. I have the permission to have exceptions. So although I don't work on weekends, we have incentive events like conferences and certifications that do go into the weekends. And, and the reason we do that is because people have traveled so far to attend the event. We don't want them to just have downtime, you know, for days before we start up again. So well, many times we, we might be taken off a Saturday, but we're back to work on Sunday. Okay. So I, I reserve the right to have exceptions to my boundaries, but I take them as exceptions, not a day-to-day -day or routinely thing that I'm yeah. doing. Agreed. And the other thing I'll do with the boundaries, okay, we're gonna work on we're gonna work on Sunday. It's okay to take Thursday off. You know, I I, I can take that time at another time. Now, we, we had Mardi Gras day before yesterday, so I'm taking it. It was Tuesday. Took it off. So. You still go to Mardi Gras, huh? Well, no, I just took the day off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other thing that can happen with our calendars where they become hijacked is we get time vampires. And there is it's two types of time vampires. So time vampires could be people that can just suck up a lot of your time. You, you know that when you take that call or you take that meeting, it could just go on forever. And I, and I think it's important that we set boundaries to that or we just make sure that time vampires are not allowed into our calendar. But there are also time vampires that are not necessarily people, but they're activities we get involved in. Eddie mentioned earlier, uh, a time vampire could be engaging in something you're not equipped to do. Okay, me learning how to do technology could time, time vampire an entire day for me just to learn what might be necessary for me to know to accomplish a job. Uh, for, for many people we have out there, sometimes their social media are time vampires. You know, they, they get on there to make a post, to make some comments, whatever it is. The next thing you know, they didn't even, they weren't even aware that not only minutes, but hours have passed by. Eddie, do you have any examples of some time vampires? Well, the technology one is certainly one that, that is, is uh, luring for a lot of people. It's, um, it's new and it's innovative for, for a lot. And when they get on there, there's always something new to do and it's, it can get exciting. And before you know it, four or five hours runs by. So that's definitely one of those ones that can do that. Time vampires, as you mentioned, were you know, letting apartments go really long. I think the, one of the biggest time vampires that you'll, or the reason you'll end up with time vampires is not knowing what your priority things are to do in the first place. So uh, you end up taking things that absolutely served you, did you no good, or did they even did the other person any good? So those could be some time vampires. Um, and then there's a lot of the wrong target markets, the wrong, you know, things that, that, that don't serve you, the business, or your family. Uh, those are the things that are in abundance all around us. How about you? Yeah. you know, one of the ways we can identify what the time vampires are for our business is simply tracking our, our day. And you can track it in, you know, in chunks of 15 minutes, almost think of like a billable attorney. You know, just track it. Now, you don't have to do this you know, every day or every month. But if you do it for a week or two, you're probably going to find some habits or consistencies. Okay, hey, here's where I'm getting trapped. Okay, or here's where I'm putting some some time or effort in that I better be spending that time somewhere else. You know, you know, again, it's not only about marketing, but many times when we see people that are doing marketing activities, we say, okay, wait, wait a minute. what if we what if we do? We don't have to, but what if we just took that amount of time, that two or three hours a week, and invested it into deeper relationships with strategic alliances? So that better serve, you know, your, your growth to reinvest it. But you have to know where you're going to take it from as opposed to just adding. Yeah, I would say, too, so, that something to keep an eye on would be uh, if you're reluctant to dele delegate or give to someone else, uh, you know, that you have in your organization. Um, even simple things like opening, you know, having the mail sorted or whatever. It's amazing the amount of things that, you know, we, or if you say to yourself, well, I mean, if it's going to get done, I might as well do it myself. It'll take me twice as long to train somebody. 
you know, all those things are the things that end up being time vampires. Um, and it has to do with holding on to control of things that you really don't need to. That's a that's another t time vampire. Yeah, I, I know I've heard you consult people in the past, Eddie, talking about getting time back, and it's not necessarily the projects that involve work, but the projects involved in your life. Absolutely. Um, well, can you, yeah, can you so get well, to cut the lawn? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, do the, you know, come and do the laundry. You know, so many people have like a, a personal um, distance or some kind of reservation about having someone come clean the house or cut the lawn or take care of those things, um, and yet they're buried. And probably don't. So in a lot of cases, maybe have the budget to hire an employee. Well, you don't have to. You know, can you get some of the stuff that's on your back off? Because they become time vampires as well. And hours are hours at that point. You know, anything you can get back to give you a little relief is just going to make it better. So delegate uh, or assign out responsibility to people who would, would love to love to help you out and um, not taking on the things you're not well equipped to do. You know, for someone who's really overloaded, those would be the easy places to look. Mm -hmm. And another one is, this is maybe one of my pet peeves, is unreasonable access to you. Uh, you know, one of the beauties with technology is the things that we're able to do from a from a smartphone or from a laptop or from a, a, any number of a devices. And, and in many cases, the way they're set up with notifications, they become constant distractions. Okay, or you know, more more than just even a distraction, it's an, an interruption of what you're doing. And I I watch many business people fall victim to this, where because because they have a cell phone, because they published it, they feel obligated to take every call or return every call as it's happening. And my personal belief is it's many, many businesses, it's not necessary. Okay. And the expense is you're not servicing the people you could be or should be servicing at that time. Uh, for example, if, if I'm working with a client, am I tension gets distracted because of a cell phone buzzing or because somebody calling me. Okay. That's a diversion from where my attention should have been. And that would have been solely working with that client. Um, Eddie, do you have any suggestions on how to better manage that unreasonable access? Yeah. Um, several. One is have dedicated times where you do it. I know when, cause I'm actually still kind of in that position, but when I was working locally, more than I would kind of set up shop at a coffee shop or a meeting place, whatever. And either people would come or call during the times that I was there and I wasn't moving. So that's helpful. Um, I guess understanding when you have certain times available. So if I needed to really concentrate on marketing or doing some kind of specified work, then that's who got access on those, on those, in, the, in those time slots. So not being the one who moves around all the time and kind of limiting the, I guess, the better access or the longer access to what's really important for you at that moment or you really need to, it's important to you to help somebody else out, same thing, those things. And then I think the other thing is not be the only person who gives all the time. And what I mean by give is you make the concession because in our world, we have people all around the globe, if you went the whole thing. So as the sun's moving, there's somebody that wants to talk to me, for example. And if, if we work that, then I'm okay with arranging calls with people or doing things with people some in some off hours because it requires, if they're in Australia, for example, that I might have to take a call at 8 o'clock at night to accommodate the person in Australia. Well, it's okay, too, if he takes a call at 8 o'clock at night sometimes, too, because it's 12 hours. So for me, not to being the only one who's giving it, so it doesn't wear me out. So the access, but it's unreasonable if I'm going to be the one who's the one always up in the middle of the night, say. Or some people's weekends are different. You know, like for example, in Dubai, the uh, Sunday, Friday and Saturday is their weekend, not Sunday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So, you know, once in a while, we'll have Phil call me on a Friday, which is his weekend, and other times, and I'll do it on Sundays, but we kind of alternate it. So the unreasonable access availability 24-7, um, that is not good. 
and at the same time, it's not good to shut people off. So um, making sure you've got good concentration on who has available to you at what times, being not the only person who does it. And man, set up shop someplace. And during those periods, then you can schedule appointment after appointment after appointment and not be the one moving around. Those would be some of the ideas I'd have right off the bat. Yeah, I think people trying to position themselves as 24 seven access is, <coughs> is a terrible mistake. Um, for, for your life, your health, for your business, you know, it's, it's really implementing your boundaries, okay, into your devices. You know, that that I'm that I'm you know that at these times I'm not I'm not taking calls you know that um and, yeah, and, and, and kind feeling of, that, you know it kind of comes off sometimes all or nothing for example if I say I'm not going to take a call at eight o'clock at night as you said I have the permission to make exceptions I'm not doing it mm -hmm. every night at eight o'clock it's not to say I'll never do one because that's again about right. being flexible for the other guy it's here and there but I can't make it a, I can't make it a pattern. Uh, because, again, I don't pay for it somewhere, and I don't want to pay for it with my family and my friends and isolation and all those other things, too. All right. No, that's that, that, that's exactly right. That all, all of these boundaries, all of these rules uh, come with exceptions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Eddie, you, you and I, we, we've had we've had partner meetings and that, you know, on, on weekends, uh, on schedules. Yeah. But it was something important. We had to make an exception. Yep. And and I think that's that's okay to do, just not to make it a habit. Um, you know, along with the unreasonable access, um, important that we communicate to our key stakeholders w the best ways to communicate with us. You know, for example, I am obsessive with email. Okay, people that email me, I mean, unless it's something that's really going to take some work on my part, uh, responses are you know, within hours sometimes. I mean, they, they, they're just, it's something I'm very obsessed with. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to preface this. I'm, I'm obsessed with email, and I don't rely on my handheld device for email. Okay, and the reason for that is I want to be at my desk, and I want to have access, okay, to documents, to tools, to whatever I need so that I can make sure that I'm servicing the person that I'm maybe, maybe responding to. OK, now I say that because as, as obsessive as I am with email, a lot of other forms of communication I am not even conscious of. Uh, people send WhatsApp or even even sometimes Facebook messages. And it's like they didn't see it. Was it was wasn't on my radar? Well, it's important that the people that are stakeholders of mine understand how to best communicate with me. All right, yeah. and I just want to say when we talk about unreasonable access, okay, all bets are off if you're in emergency services. We we <laughs> typically think about people in businesses that are not necessarily emergency services. Yeah. So what I would add to this too. So if you if you're really out there thinking, no, I have to be available twenty four seven, which I did at one time in a business that I had think that way, was really what was going on there was I didn't have help. Um, I didn't trust anybody else to do it as good as I did, for example. Um, yeah, I have scarcity mindset. Somebody else is going to get it, not me, kinds of things. Now, those are all some of the symptoms of why someone, except for emergency services, would feel they have to be available for somebody to call them 24-7. And, you know, if that's the case, then it's, it's a good indicator to start. Okay, you know, if I'm in that behavior now, then how can I start to let some of this go? and get it back to a more reasonable schedule. And the customer still gets the service because it's definitely not necessary for, it wasn't necessary for me to be the only guy that could do it 24-7. You know, there were ways, I just didn't want to let them, let them happen. So usually an indicator there too, if, if you're doing that. Hmm. Uh, the other thing we want to talk about in, in managing the calendar is other people taking control. And specifically, that's the taking control of, uh, we need to do this now. Uh, as a general rule, and there are times we need to do things now. As a general rule, anytime somebody's contacting me or is um, looking for some time, we're going to schedule an appointment. And and I not only in terms of managing my calendar, but also in terms of managing the conversation. Okay, if I if I have it scheduled that you know Eddie and I are going to be talking tomorrow at three o'clock, it's in my calendar, 
And at three o'clock, we're both prepared to have the conversation. Okay. I'm not interrupting something else he might be doing at that time. He's not interrupting something I'm going to be doing. And we can confirm that we're all on the same page for the meeting. And so, you know, generally speaking, my, my emails uh, communication allows me to set appointments. But then once we have the appointment set, it's set. And I want to say that again. When the appointment is set, it's set. That's one of the habits I saw with the successful people. When they were setting appointments, okay, there were a commitment that they were going to stand behind. It wasn't, well, well it's set for now, however. And the, and the howevers were very broad as to what else was going to move those events. And I'll, I'll give you a, kind of an example of what that looked like. I had people that have booked these times with me, and there, a lot of times they were booked out a couple of months in advance. I would send them a confirmation email that were booked at that time. I would send them a follow-up email that I was going to need, okay, confirming the time, whether we're meeting in person, okay, or it was going to be on the phone, okay? So we had confirmed the, the meetings. We knew we were going to talk about. And <clears throat> those people that were, again, but the, the more successful business owners, in many cases, they, they were coming to me because they wanted it face-to-face. And coming to me could have been taken another hour or two out of their calendar. Now, on the surface, you would think, well, those people probably had less time to make available. Yet they were the ones that said, I knew this was going to be much more valuable to me if I was able to do it face to face rather than on the phone. So I wanted to do the t make the time. Conversely, many of the people that had struggling businesses would make an appointment and then at the last minute, okay, or a day before, cancel. Hey, can't make it. Something came up. I got a client I need to go see. Can we reschedule? Like, reschedule? My, my next opening is like in four months. Um, but to them, that was a constant flux in their, in their calendar. They were constantly moving things around or putting them thing and taking them out. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I think your willingness to make a commitment is also part of mastering that calendar that, no, it's in there. Okay, and and I didn't and I didn't take the appointment lightly. Eddie, do you have any uh, insight on on that level of commitment? You know, it's the same as the other things. You know, about the boundaries and the and the um, what's important and uh, getting it planned, as as we'll talk about. So you know what you're supposed to be doing in the first place. That that kind of allows that to creep in, not to creep in. And then also, if you're doing it, and you find yourself where you're not in control of some of these things, or if um, you know you're not adhering to the boundaries, or have some of those other things we talked about, it's like, okay, what's driving this? Because that's what needs to change. Then you can master the calendar. You know, so it works both ways. If you you know can take control of it, and it happens good. And if for some reason you're, you're having difficulty, then it's also indicating that there's something not letting you do it, and that needs to be taken care of first. So just even the pursuit of doing this is a good activity. You know, the one exception I'm thinking about right now, Eddie, is a few years ago, we were set up and prepared to do an instructor certification. Uh, everything was planned, everything's calendared. And then all of a sudden that morning, I come back and, uh, well, Eddie, uh, we've, I've taken Dawn to the emergency room. She's in surgery right now. She's having her appendix taken out. Enjoy the show. <laughs> okay, now let's see what we're going to do next. <laughs> Um, so it's it's not to say that you know the, the, again the exceptions are always going to be there. It's just how how often are you going to allow something else to get in the way? It's certainly something like that where you had no choice. All right. So the other one was uh, in preparation, and I really think this is really tied closely to the calendar. I think without mastering the calendar, without having our own plan in place, that you're not going to have time for preparation. Okay. Okay, and when I talk about preparation, uh, I'll give you an example. One of the things every consultant would require is a business intake form. And a business intake form is, you know, it's only several pages, but, you know, it really looks at, you know, what structures do they have in place? Do they have a business plan? What are the financials doing? Is business going up or down? What are the frustrations they're having in the business? Uh, what I consider very important and useful information, even if we weren't having a consultation, and when I looked at the successful people, it's like they thoroughly filled out 
the business intake forms. And not only did they thoroughly fill those business intake forms out, is they made sure that I had it with plenty of advance notice. Uh, I would ask for it a week ahead of time. In many cases, it would be submitted to me a month ahead of time. Okay, so that they were prepared. And with that work they did, when they came to the meeting, they were prepared to answer what I consider the most important question. What is the biggest challenge you're having today that you would like to discuss and have us work on today? And, and they were prepared to answer those questions. They, know, they knew what they wanted to get out of the meeting. But again, when people are unprepared, in many cases, they were filling those forms out at the last minute. Okay, there wasn't a lot of detail in those forms. And in terms of their intention for the meeting, I don't know. I'm hoping to get some piece of insight of how I can change my business. Uh, that's the level of focus they had for the meeting. And, and this, this, again, all comes around preparation. Now, I'm talking about having a, a consulting session, and I believe this shows up everywhere. I think this shows up when we're, when we're networking and we're marketing. I think this shows up uh, when we're prepared to do a sales presentation. How well do we know the needs of the prospect? You know, not just, okay, I know what my product and service is, so I can talk about that all day long, but really prepared in understanding what the, what the prospect is going through. Again, I, I feel that this this is really a game changer of why there were people making significant amounts of money while other people were uh, struggling to make money. How are you, Eddie? Yeah, the, the, the research and gaining the insights and helping other people gain insights is a, in the marketing aspect, is a, is a tremendous advantage because it's not a large percentage of the people that go through the trouble to do that kind of different type of selling where they're offering the coverage customer a little bit something different than they expected and not just in the product but making them aware of something they weren't aware of before that, could, that would either confirm or change their buy for example uh, that's, that's added value and if you can go if you go in knowing as much about or more about their business or that, what they're doing than they do that is a tremendous advantage uh, and or a very helpful advantage at the, at the very least Preparation is also good too for mastering the calendar. Um, you will have a less, you'll be much more concise in the things you do, the actions you take, how you talk to people when you are prepared. So an hour of preparation could save you three or four hours of, of different things from going you know, travel to the meeting time itself to having the wrong people there even. So the preparation uh, is is key as it says, and thankfully it's. It is a little bit easier to do preparation these days because the research online is so good that you can find out a lot of things and delve into the industry in other parts of the world even and find things that would be helpful or gain, gain some insight as to what you're going to accomplish. Big thing. It has a lot of benefits. Uh, I, I, I am reminded of that every day. I wonder how did we ever do this before? No idea. <laughs> uh, I, I will not take, I do not take phone calls. Okay, that I haven't Googled the person. Okay, it's like I, 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 I'm going to know something about them by looking at their profiles. I'm going to have some type of reference of who I'm just going to be speaking to before I just pick up a phone and try to figure it out over the phone for the next five minutes. And again, that, that was not available to us not that long ago. So yeah, preparation is easier. And I, I really feel this is so linked to the calendar. It's, it's through managing and mastering the calendar uh, that you are allowed the opportunity to be prepared. And then in being prepared, like you mentioned, Eddie, you're, you're more effective and more efficient. So, preparation, one of the other key habits. Okay, And then finally, knowing the numbers. The, the level of understanding with the people that are truly successful and the lack of clarity for those that weren't was absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, when you know when I look at numbers, I know the importance of numbers, and I and I can appreciate it. And at the same time, I don't like to be overly complex with numbers. I, I think there are simple things that you're going to need to know about for most people's business. Knowing who the prospects are in the pipeline, knowing what the revenue is. I mean, those those by themselves 
could give the business direction. Uh, Eddie, when you and I were in the hospitality business, well, you had to know a few more. You, you had to constantly, and I say constantly, every week, you know, know what the payroll and payroll percentage was, knowing what the food cost was, the beverage costs. Uh, of course, some of the fixed costs are going to be you know, month to month. But th those variables, if you weren't controlling those, if you weren't looking at those daily, okay, at the end of the month, at the end of the day, you could be literally losing money. All right, so you, you have to identify what the key numbers are, okay, and then have a system in place where you can review them on an appropriate frequency. For example, a profit and loss for me <coughs> today is a monthly activity. And, you know, when I'm in the restaurant business, those other numbers I talked about, those were weekly. Uh, <coughs> when we looked at the um, analyzing marketing evaluations, uh, we look at the different vehicles they're using to market their business. And again, people that were successful were able to tell me in detail what the conversions look like for each of the different vehicles. They were able to say, well, you know, my online creates a lot of activity with a small closing percentage. Well, that would make sense. Okay, my relationship marketing has a less frequent prospect things, but they come up at higher quality and better conversion. Again, that would make sense. But only when you know them and can quantify them can you make decisions on, okay, so what should I be doing more of? Where should I be investing more resources into? Andy, some of your uh, insights on knowing your numbers and tracking your data. Well, you were just talking about the marketing thing. Measuring the results is a key piece of whether, you know, to, to do more of it or less. And so everyone knows today that I'd say for the majority of businesses out there that the internet or the web-based marketing is very important. And if you really want to jack it up, you can use AdWords. And if someone is, is um, you know, if you're buying SEO services or you're buying AdWords things, you're not getting the reports about what's the important words or what the results have been around those words in your own experience. Um, then you're kind of doing yourself a disservice because you may be spreading your number, your money over a lot of words, for example, and maybe only three or four of them are really working. So you can either put more into that one or go look for other terms that would do it. But I've seen place after place that, that, that actually never saw the data. I just bought the SEO and I guess just assumed it was done. And it happened more than I would like to have believed, but it happens quite a bit. So tracking your data around your marketing, your spends would be good. The restaurant was interesting because it was um, the numbers were about uh, control and exactly right because theft prevention. If you weren't watching it, it would it would either get wasted or it would get walk out. Uh, either way, it's kind of a theft. Um, but knowing what the critical numbers are for your business, and there are industry standards out there. Uh, if you belong to one of your trade organizations, they will have numbers percentages that relate to the size business you are in general uh, for the type of business you're in. So for example, I, I did help a pest control company and I remember, I don't remember exactly which one it was, but the pest control, the um, product cost for one of the things that we doing should be like two or 3% and then the, like the termites were like 50%. So that made them separate their books into categories that they could track. And when they were doing that, they got a lot better because then they knew where they were making money and losing money and you know, what, who was wasting this product or whatever. It's, it's, it's something, I guess, it's a little, it could be a little bit elusive at first, but then once you kind of get the, the understanding of being able to break it down in those categories, it can get real clear for you real quick and you can program your QuickBooks or whatever you use to generate that report for you on whatever basis you need, weekly, daily, monthly. It's not complicated anymore after that, and it's so telling when you get it. It's, it's almost for a guy who's not a numbers guy by nature. I guess it was very, very satisfying to look at them because it's kind of a win-loss thing. Yeah, I think back when I was uh, racing and cycling, and I had hired a coach, and one of the most impressive things he said to me is, he says, "The more I know, the more I can help you." And specifically, he was talking about our tracking. And, you know, this sounds obsessive, but it actually wasn't that difficult. Uh, we would track every 
event, every training event, every racing event to miles, feet climbed, heart rate, speed, cadence of every minute of those rides. Okay? We would track everything that was eating, not only what was eaten, but the volume that was eating to, to my diet. Okay? We would track daily my resting heart rate when I woke up every morning to determine if I was overtraining or not. Now that sounds a little bit obsessive and stuff. First of all, it wasn't that difficult, but it was with that level of data that he was able to adjust what I need to be doing for the next month. <laughs> this sounds a little odd, but we actually checked the, the lactose, I believe it's the lactose or lactate in my blood. So he would actually have me training at different intensities and then he'd be taking blood and testing it. And again, his thing was, the more I know, the more I can help you. Okay, without the data, all he's doing is guessing. Saying yeah. things like, so Eddie, how do you, how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> no kidding all right uh, so i think this the same thing is going to apply in business so we are coming to the end of this month's show uh what i'd like to do is open it up if you have some questions on uh, anything we've discussed so far you can just put that into the questions area okay and we will be able to answer that when we do complete here we will have a behind the scenes continue with the show if you'd like to ask questions then as well but let me open it up see if anyone has any questions for eddie or myself okay okay i see i see one question here it says uh are we getting a copy of this presentation uh without our host the net Polito, I'm going to say likely, but no guarantees, because what we mentioned earlier about the technology kind of left my own devices here, but I will attempt to, uh, it is being recorded, I will attempt to save it, and I will attempt to be able to distribute it as well. Yeah, I think that's actually an automatic function, thank God. <laughs> so here's another question. Uh, at what stage were you mastering your calendar? At what stage? I, and I imagine that has to do with uh, in your business, and I'll, Eddie, I'll let you. I'll let you start with that one. Um, when I finally allowed somebody to come in and help me out with running the business, and although I was good at necessarily getting th getting it going and and driving it and creating the revenues and all those good things, somebody finally got hold of me and sat me down and, and showed me the numbers, things, and this and that, and. When that happened, when I started understanding what was the business really about, what were we really trying to sell, what was the most profitable things, what were the things that we were best equipped to do, well, that eliminated a lot of things, which made putting the proper things on the calendar possible. Without knowing that, you're still kind of guessing at what goes on the calendar. So getting your, your important things figured out as to what has to happen allows a lot of other things to become much more clear. And then I started mastering the calendar when I had the 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 right the right data, then I kind of knew who I needed to market to, who I needed to collaborate with, who I needed to network with, for example, or where I needed to educate myself or train my staff on. Is because I knew now was I got better clarity on what was important. That's when I started to master the calendar. Yeah. You know, I, I, I feel like I always had a strong control of my calendar, but there had to be a major transition because I had a strong control of my calendar, but I was stuck in doing everything myself. So I, I had two traits. I excelled at both, and that was working a lot and working hard. And that's a transition that needed to happen. That it's okay to get help. It's okay to ask for help. As a matter of fact, once you start collaborating, your business simply accelerates. Uh, so it became mastering the calendar in a better way as opposed to ha having it or not having it. So I, that would say it was my biggest experience. Yeah, I think one of the things that I used to catch myself doing a lot was I'm going to go meet with this guy. You know, he's he is involved in this, whatever that was. And, man, if it worked out right with him, I could get so much. Okay, well, that kind of conversation in my head came around by not being clear about what I needed. You know, what were the what were the, what were the important things and what I was best suited for? It just sounded like a good idea, 
but it wasn't backed up by anything. So it mm-hmm. would go on my calendar, and then I'd have a, a wasted appointment, or who knows, maybe once in a while a lottery winner, but that didn't happen often. But you know. Yeah. Great. Right. Well, folks, that does bring us to the end of this spectacular entrepreneur show. I, you know, I hope you really do embrace these habits: mastering the calendar, coming prepared, and knowing your numbers. Uh, I, I do believe there are habits that are game changers. Uh, next month, uh, we have another game changer. And although these are the three big ones, I'm going to tell you this fourth one is very insightful as well. I'm not going to tell you what that is, uh, but that will be coming up on our next webinar. Uh, closing comments from you, Eddie. Uh, no, and um, I wholeheartedly agree with all the things that we've said here today because they are uh, – the things that you can start taking control of, regardless, uh, if you don't have any uh, major uh, things figured out, some things you have to spend a lot of time to figure out, I should say. Uh, there's a lot of things in here you can start taking control of now that will have good results in re- relieving chaos, pointing you in the right direction, understanding what's driving certain things. So there's a lot of good things here. Awesome. Well, folks, we will be going backstage. If you'd like to join us and uh, ask us any questions or make any comments, uh, we will be ending the show. So everyone have a profitable week, and it was great having you on the show today.